Good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of improving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes, train the training material, if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course, and have a good time. Greetings and welcome to Lesson 3, The French Revolution and Napoleon. My name is Dr. George Gavrich. Joining me will be Lieutenant Colonel Scott Stevenson. If you remember, we were with you with Lesson 1. And based on that performance, I know they can hardly wait for what we have before. Exactly, here in exactly. And yeah. uh, since last time we talked about limited war, it seems like we shouldn't stick on the same message but talk about something different. What we're going to be talking about is a revolution in military affairs of a tremendous, tremendous scope. If you remember when we talked about the age of Frederick the Great, is an age of limited war where armies fought often for just the territory next to the kingdom. The battles basically lasted less less than a day. Most of the battles were sieges. On the rarer side, did you have open field battles? With the French Revolution and the emergence of Napoleon, warfare is going to take on a whole different dimension. We're going to be talking about Napoleon being able to raise a half a million man army plus and march all the way to Moscow, while at the same time having a half a million army down in Spain. Something unheard of. A war economy that can sustain battles for several days. Napoleon said, I could lose 30,000 people in one day and fight again another day. Something Frederick could not afford to say. Something monarchs before him could not say. So we're talking about a transformation in warfare from an age of limited war to what some people say starts to move toward total war, general war, where battles and armies are on a whole different scale than ever before. Um, the way I think this lesson could be organized is it's important to see that any great commander like Napoleon, a genius, military genius, is a product of his time. So it'd be good to talk a little bit about the French military and the innovations they're trying to bring in, then talk about the French Revolution. Some say there couldn't have been no Napoleon without the French Revolution. What impact does the French Revolution have on warfare? So in the first case, we're talking about some military influences. In the second case, non-military influences as they sh shape and help explain this new warfare that emerges. And then we need to talk about Napoleon himself and the system that he creates. What changes does he bring uh, to make for warfare on a whole different scale? And then end by looking at how he gets defeated at Waterloo and his undoing. Let's look at first the, the French military. 
if you remember uh, Napoleon, uh, not Napoleon, I should say Frederick the Great beat up on the French military. After it was all over with, a good number of French officers, serious about their profession, thought about how they could reform so that they would not be beaten by Frederick again. And I think it's important to talk about some of the changes that are brought about in the French military because Napoleon's going to be raised as a young officer in this monarchical military, the Ansan regime, and he'll take ideas of those reformers and put them together. So let's talk a little bit about the French military uh, before Napoleon and the French Revolution. There's a, there's a couple of figures uh, that, that get mentioned, or several figures that get mentioned over and over again. One of them is Guibert, who, who's, who talks, uh, is making some stabs at the military theory, and we talked about military theory. Could he be like the Tofflers of uh, back then? or? Yeah. Uh, Great thinkers looking at the future and the present and making sense of it. Depends on how you look at the Tofflers, doesn't it? Okay. <laughs> All right. But uh, here, here's a fellow who's who's thinking about the future war. Says that war may may take on a whole new scope. That it, once you get the people involved, remember in, in Frederick's time that normally you try to keep the people out of, off the battlefield. You have your pr trained professional armies, and again the ideal is to be able to march an army through a, through a province and have the population not even know about it. But uh, what happens if you get the population involved? This, this may think, throw things off. Gebert's got some theorizing about that. Of course, he can look across uh, the ocean in last lesson, lesson two about the American Revolution, and see there is a people involved. And what does that mean for the future warfare? Absolutely. Some thoughts about that. There's another f fellow named Gribeval who um, who institutes a whole bunch of changes, especially in French French artillery, toward making it more mobile, more more of a. Uh, uh, instrument of supporting maneuver on the battlefield. He lightens up the, the caissons, he uh, lightens up the, the um, and standardizes the, the, the different pieces of artillery and makes that uh, a much more useful, effective tool than the, than the heavy guns that had to be dragged around the battlefield. And once you set them in place, basically they stand there for the whole battle. Uh, under Grievald, French artillery is going to probably be the most uh, technically advanced in Europe. I think the interesting point there is uh, uh, Frederick was very good with his infantry. They were the, the centerpiece of his army. The French cannot drill to that level, they feel. Is there a cultural problem? A cultural think? problem. So they can fall back That's on what, what makes their strengths. They're, they got famous engineers and they got f famous artillery people. They've got more resources so they could build more artillery pieces. So what they end up doing is playing to some of their strengths. Building up the artillery, they have the resources to have more artillery pieces, standardize it, make it lightweight, and you've got some artillery theorists who are saying, if we can do these things with artillery and start massing it because it's lighter, faster, we can maybe make artillery the decisive arm on the battlefield. A kind of a revolutionary thought. Napoleon is what? An artilleryman. Indeed. He is exposed to these ideas, he's exposed to these reforms, and he is in one of those experimental units that's playing around with yeah. these artillery pieces. Well, I think it's also interesting, he has a Corsican, a guy who comes up, shows up at military school with a heavy Italian accent, he's sort of an outsider, and he doesn't have access, coming from minor Corsican nobility to the more fashionable regiments, either infantry or cavalry. So for him, going into artillery, which, which accepts middle class and, and lower nobility into it, it's kind of a logical thing. Sure. So he starts out as an outsider. And here's a guy we see early on with kind of a fire burning in him, and he's willing to, willing to accept these changes that he sees going on in the French Army, and he's make, doing some thinking of his own. Uh, he's doing a lot of intensive study of military history in particular. I don't emphasize that fact. But uh, Like Frederick the Great, we should emphasize that we, too. We should emphasize that as well. I think we're on to something here. All right. Uh, but, uh, as you say, he, come, he comes up under the old monarchical army, but he's, here's a guy who's already thinking, perhaps beginning to think outside the box. But it takes a, a series of circumstances that sort of give this, this young Corsican upstart his opportunity. Um, and here's where you're, as an instructor, you've got to do some decisions to make. You may want to fill in uh, blanks for students about what the French Revolution is about, if, if you feel up to that. Otherwise, <laughs> I'd get past it as soon as you can. You've got to mention it, at least in passing, uh, because it sets the stage for the, what some people what some people consider to be the greatest general of all time, Napoleon, what, what some people refer to as the god of war, Napoleon Bonaparte. He's a product of uh, his upbringing in the old army. He's a product also of the revolution. 
Um, the French Revolution is, 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 is a complicated thing, and whole libraries have been devoted to it. it, it uh, a lot of it has to do with the financial crisis that hits France in the late 1780s. Part of it uh, brought on by supporting our own revolution. Uh, part of it by a long series of wars att attempt attempting to gain some domination in Western Europe. A financial crisis that allows the, some classes in French society that haven't had a voice, the middle class and lower nobility, uh, rise up and, and attempt to, to seize a larger measure of power. And, uh, well, it, it's, it's also, I think it's an agrarian and an economic crisis, lead to a political crisis. You know, the, the, the king attempts to flee the country, uh, Louis XVI, he gets captured, he gets beheaded, and all of a sudden, all the crowned heads of Europe uh, are starting to starting to get a little nervous about what does this mean when people can rise up and overthrow and then then execute a king the whole system is at risk here and so all the major powers unite to put down this French Revolution sort of like the Bolshevik Revolution brings in the rest of the world against it and the Iranian Revolution when it emerges people want to stop it yeah uh, you don't play with revolution well this is a key and uh, I'm in here Again, we, we talked about Fred the Great and the Seven Years' War. You look at the correlation of forces against him, he doesn't have a chance. You look at the same thing with, uh, with France in 1793, 1794. Its, its army has not fallen apart, the old monarchical, monarchical army. It's lost its officer corps. About a third of its, its enlisted ranks have gone off and deserted. Uh, it is in, in bad shape, and all of a sudden it's, it's facing the, the the various houses of Europe are marching on its frontiers with big armies, and it looks like the res this revolution is going to be stamped out just as quickly as it rose up. The question is, how does a revolution like this, made by the people, how does it defend itself? What do you think? Well, I think one of the things that uh, is important to ask is, what does the French Revolution do to the character of war? And there is, a, first of all, a major change in the political system. We see nationalism rising up, the power of the people. This is really, you could say, the emergence of the nation state. What then then means in this revolutionary fervor is people see, wow, the old monarchy has gone away. A lot of the aristocrats are fleeing. I have a stake in this revolution. People who are nobodies are all of a sudden head of revolutionary committees. They have a stake in saving this revolution because this is a government for the people. So what you see is where the peasant tolerated so soldiers marching by, or I should say probably more in the cities, mm -hmm. tolerated soldiers. Now he's willing to take up arms and join and go out on the field and fight under this elan, the spirit of revolution and nationalism. And, you, and it doesn't need mo to be motivated. Yeah. He's got the motivation no. within. Now you've got to somehow yeah. drill him, train him a little bit, and you've got enough of the old guard to help with the professional side, but you've got a lot of now these guys willing to fight. So there's a zeal that takes him for a few years and helps him yeah. to win on the battlefield. Yeah. That's one thing. So the nature of the political state has changed, which means if you want to fight Napoleon or before that the revolutionary regime, a lot of military people who are progressive will say, you've got to change the way we do business with our own people so we get them on our side and we see this flow of the nation state into the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, I think. Yeah. And then the second thing is, if the state has changed and become more a uh, nation state, the army has become national. You don't longer will need mercenaries as time goes on because you will conscript people from yeah. within. Mm -hmm. These people don't have to be called up. They naturally rise up when the call comes and says, we need to fight for the revolution. They'll start going well, coercion out. Coercion helps sometimes. A little bit, a little bit. But as time goes on, what has happened? You haven't changed the industrial base. The agrarian society has not really changed. But what has happened is people have been fired up within a short period of time, and now we have a new standard, a new mindset. So like you start with your first income tax, little, and then you build on it. What then happens is you can now take that fervor. You could take that mass army that's a million strong armed, and now put in the mechanisms, the coercion, the conscription. So from now on, you can mobilize the society and raise armies on a much larger scale, which means you could take losses on a much larger scale than before and replenish them with conscription. Yeah. So we have the emergence of national armies yeah. and wars of nations. Yeah, whereas in Frederick's time, a single battle can decide uh, an entire war. When the French revolutionary regime can put, in the mid-1790s, a million men into the field, all of a sudden, you can't beat those guys in a single battle. You're going to have to organize right. a campaign. It, it, this is, you, you've got a whole new order of problem here that you've got to take on with the, when you're facing a million. Now, it's a, still a ragbag. 
big force. Let's face it. How are you going to take? You, you've got, you've built an army, but if it's still these these untrained citizens, how are you going to turn this into effective effective force? And that's the problem that the revolutionary generals faced. It's a thorny problem, a pressing problem, and especially because the revolutionary leaders tend to. Uh, tend to take generals who lose in battle and they tend to get make an appointment with Madame Guillotine. So if you're a general, you're motivated to think about better ways to organize all this mass of manpower oh, you true. have. That's a good point. Uh, one, one of the solutions they come up with that's uh, uh, relatively ingenious is, what they'll, is they'll take a battalion of the, the old regular French royal troops and they'll put them with a battalion or two of these new conscripts to create what's called the demi-brigade. The idea being that, that the, the well-drilled, well-disciplined uh, old regime troops will serve as an example for these new conscripts who, who, as willing as they may be, don't know a thing about fighting uh, and, and make them, their example of these royal, royal troops, these old royal troops, uh, will turn this, this demi-brigade into effective fighting force. But this, so what you're facing, if, if, you're, uh, one of the, if you're trying to take down the French Revolution, you're, you're facing huge armies, you're facing armies that uh, are motivated by something you haven't seen on the battlefield, you know, patriotic fervor and nationalism, and uh, the nature of these troops allows them to be used in ways you haven't seen before either. Um, I think the interesting thing too is if you compare it to the Bolshevik Revolution or the Iranian Revolution, you have their emergence of people outside of the military in power who don't trust the military, Poli political commissars, religious commissars in there. The French Revolution brings to power Napoleon, who's a general, mm -hmm. already a proven general. He'll take the talent that's there, that's demonstrated by these young officers who fought and won on the battlefield, have been elected, promoted, and he'll use their talents to mobilize them into a better army, a better trained army, mm -hmm. and use that fighting power now to conquer. Yeah. Rather than fear the army, yeah. subdue it, he will use all its resources to the maximum, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah, he, uh, Napoleon is probably a guy in the old uh, Royal Army probably doesn't get beyond captain or major in, in the career. And all of a sudden, though, due to being at the right place at the right time, defending uh, the the, uh, the national government against a coup attempt uh, with the, the famous whiff of grape shot, all of a sudden gets elevated to general, gets a theater command down in Italy, becomes a national hero, and this is a springboard to eventually to take power. But uh, you know, he he's going to bring his own genius to this piece, but you got to remember that he is inheriting, like Frederick inherited the system his father built. Uh, Napoleon will inherit some important advantages from the the French Revolution. Because number one, they've answered the problem: where does the manpower come from? It comes from the entire populace. Number two, where do the officers come from? Well, as as George has said, you now recruit across all classes of society. You use some of the old officers if they're willing to serve. Most of them have gone overseas or been beheaded, but you recruit by talent now, by merit, which is is a revolution in itself. Okay, I got the people, I got the officers, how do I arm them? You orient your entire national economy towards supporting these huge new armies you're putting in, in the field. This is the first appearance of what some people call uh, war, 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 war socialism. A war economy. Yeah, war economy. And that's done by a guy named Carnot who's called the organizer of the revolution even before Napoleon takes over. He is now helping to organize the state Indeed. to keep these guys funded. Okay, so I got, well, funding is another piece too, yeah. but uh, we're going to we're going to orient our government toward producing resources. So I've got the manpower, I've got the officers, I'm going to orient my economy toward keeping them equipped. Now I've got an, yet another thorny problem. How do I feed this mass of guys? Well, here, here again is another problem. Um, and this, this sort of has impact on strategy. If I got this huge mass of guys to feed, number one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be benefited by the fact that, that uh, agriculture has taken off during this period of history. It's gonna be easier to feed the guys if I let them loose across the land. Now, Frederick couldn't do that, but I can let these guys go out and forage across the land and you know, send them out, hey, Pierre, go out and find us some chickens for tonight. And Pierre, I can have some reasonable expectation Pierre is gonna show up later on tonight. Probably with a bottle of wine. With well, the, the, yeah, <laughs> Pierre being a resourceful guy that he is, yeah, I, I would hope so. Uh, by the same token, the road networks have increased, so this increases my ability to disperse armies to go out there and forge. Right. But still, you know, the trouble is a foraging army is going to leave, uh, leave barren countryside behind it. So where do I want to deploy this army? Well, the ideal place is not in France. I want to take this. I want to take my act on the road, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, if I'm going to have this huge army, I'd much rather fight with it on foreign soil. Let you know. Let let him do his foraging in Germany or Poland or Italy or anywhere, but in France. Now, 
if I if I have an army that relies on foraging, I still have a problem because if 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 Pierre's in the lead brigade, life is good. You're going to find plenty to eat as you get on the road. But if you're uh, if you're uh, Gaston in the trail brigade, <laughs> sucking dust, there's not going to be much left when you get That's there. Right. What's the solution? Well, this is a thorny one too. It? A lot of starving goes on in these ill-managed armies. One solution is start putting your armies on multiple axes. It's just, it's a fact of life. If you want to feed them, you can't put the army on a single route like Frederick used to do. Frederick could rely on these, this carefully organized system of, of military depots. Well, a French Revolutionary Army can't do that. So by, by necessity, they're going to use multiple routes. But Napoleon's going to turn that into a benefit, isn't he? Yes, he's going to create the core system. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you can create independent commands that march down different avenues to congregate, to mass at the decisive point or for the engagement. What's interesting then is, You've got to make these corps be able to be fighting independently. Well, why is that, George? What happens if they get caught by themselves out there in the middle Against of the an enemy army? And they get defeated piecemeal. Well, so, yeah, if, if it's just a force of infantry, the enemy using yes. combined arms were overwhelmed with artillery and cavalry. Right, so what you end up doing is making these corps combined arms. You give them artillery, you give them cavalry, and you give them infantry. You've got basically independent command a core system of combined arms. Whereas, go back, remember when we were in lesson one, was it, with Rossbach? Well, when you looked at Rossbach, you had what? On the hill was the artillery, Seedlitz and his cavalry were hidden behind a hill, and the infantry was in a different place. All the arms were there, but they were not integrated at the level of integration that we're going to see with Napoleon's army. And it means now independent commands, armies not marching as one single army, but on multiple axis, each corps I, independent. I still, got a, I still got a problem with that, George, though. If, if That's why you... If, if I'm Frederick, I know I've got everybody in sight. I can keep track of my army. I can orchestrate its, its efforts on the battlefield. But if I let these guys go marching off across country under separate commands, how do I keep control of this mess? First of all, you've got to get good intelligence, you've got to have a good career system, and you teach them uh, that you march to the sound of gunfire. So you, you, what you'd have to do is find subordinate commanders who can use their own initiative. And, and well, you don't have to necessarily find them. They've all, in a way, been developed by this long series of revolutionary They've surfaced for you. So you've got your future it's marshals talent. there, and all you've got to do is just kind of give them a uh, promotion, a marshal's baton, yeah. and they've got the experience to be able to fight independently. Uh -huh. uh, and then when the fighting starts, you teach them you march to the sound of the guns. So that's kind of like a, what, kind of a uh -huh. satellite message coming down yeah. to the commander. There's fighting over there. I know what's fighting. Napoleon wants me to move there, so I move over there. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. And what, what does I, that mean then? It means you can, uh, it's going to be more difficult when that enemy comes out as a single army. Like yeah. if you look at that Prussian army coming out, it's in Frederican spirit. It's well disciplined, finely tuned, old generals who believe yeah. in Frederick. Yeah. You know, this is the army of the 18th century. Yeah. They're going out to meet the new army, and they can't figure out because it's going to be coming on multiple axes. Yeah. Where's the main? Well, yeah, this, that's that's the example I use my students. If you're looking for Frederick's army, it comes at you like this. Okay. It comes at you like this. Is there any doubt where the main effort is? Now, it's right there in that fist. If it goes like this. Okay. But what you see with, with Napoleon is that. You see, you see multiple columns. Okay, so I'm gonna commit. Where's Where's Napoleon's main effort? Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? I'm not sure. If I attack this guy, and I and I guess wrong where the main effort is, what the rest of the guys will collapse on me. And that's that's part of Napoleon's part of his gene, part of his system. He moved by cores that would move in a box, say a core at each corner of this book here. Let me put it down here where you can see it. All right. And if you uh, you go after this this core right here, the other ones are trained to move against your flanks. Wherever you hit it, if you hit it here, for example, the other guys will move to the sound of the guns. They're about a day or two uh, with each other. Each core is designed to fight independently. It's designed to fight just long enough for the rest of the cores in that box to come to his rescue. Well, what happens if I'm coming at you in a coalition? Mm -hmm. Here's a uh, Prussian army, and here's maybe a Russian army. I'm not coming towards you. What does the core system uh, allow Napoleon to do? Good question. And you'll see this again and again. Because if we unite, he's going to be more powerful. He, you see Napoleon using this in his first campaign in Italy. You see Napoleon using his last campaign at Waterloo. It's fix one force or slow it down and then and, and mass on on the other force. He is a master exploiting the the um, 
interior lines, exploiting the enemy, the, the division between enemy troops and coalitions, massing on one and then turning around and beating the other. And he'll do it again and again and again and again. Now, we, we've talked about we've talked about his system. I, I think we ought to talk about the guy himself too. What what makes him special? You know, we we said he inherited all this good stuff from the French Revolution. You know, is, is he just a lucky guy who happened to be at the right place at the right time, or what? Or does he bring something special to the art of war, to the battlefield? What do you think? I think first of all, I would say he's partly a product of his time, and that's not to demean uh, his accomplishments. We're all products of our time, for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. So he does benefit fit from the French Revolution and what it brings to warfare. He does inherit some good ideas and reforms from the French military. Uh, so I think, yes, you have to look at, he is partly a product of his time and he's partly lucky. But there's nothing wrong. What is it Napoleon once said? If I have a choice between a good general and a lucky one, I'll take the lucky one any, any day. Mm -hmm. Any day. Now, uh, I would say that one thing, too, they say about Napoleon um, is that through the study of history, reading a great deal, studying the masters, including Frederick, he developed in his own mind how he was going to command. Mm -hmm. And then once he starts to command and lead, he uses those experiences to fine tune. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that's the same scenario you see in a way with Frederick the Great. He got the tutors, he studied the history, he went out on campaigns with Eugene to observe. The first battle comes, he learns a lot from it, but he's got the base of knowledge. He's been tutored, educated well. In Napoleon's case, it's more self-taught. So that's one, I think, that mm -hmm. thing you have to keep in yeah. mind. And that's the importance of study. That's why all these great guys who are successful try to impart to their subordinates yeah. study. Yeah. What else do you think makes them? Uh, I, I keep a vivid picture in my mind of Napoleon preparing a campaign. When he anticipates he's going to go to war, say, say against Austria or, or Russia or Spain, what he'll first do is assemble all the books he can on that area, the, the geography, the topography, the social organization. Then he assembles all the books that, is, that can be be found on previous campaigns have been fought there, campaigns in Frederick's time, campaigns in ancient times. Then he assembles all the best available maps, and he will spend, apparently, according to some accounts, day after day on his hands and knees, pouring over these maps, figuring out the distance from point to point, uh, then pouring over these accounts. What's the terrain like? What are the key points? Where are the river crossings? Where is the enemy likely to deploy? And, and as he's doing that, he's starting to send out his, his uh, cavalry and his agents to go out and start developing the intelligence. He is a one-man staff. Now, he has a, a chief of staff guy named Berthier who's very good at transcribing his orders. But what this guy brings to the battlefield is a sense of time and space that, that, that normal people don't understand. An, under, an understanding of, if I move this guy here, move this guy here, where's the enemy likely to be? How fast can I react to an enemy move over here? He's got, he keeps it all up in here. Um, something that mortal men at this time have real difficulty doing. But he spent, he's, he's developed that ability by spending all this time studying the maps, developing the branches and sequels the campaign as he goes along and it's it's amazing now he's got he's got hundreds of guys working for him whether they're couriers or scribes or what have you but he's keeping the essential pieces up here and so he doesn't have a staff the way we understand it today you know when it comes time to develop courses of action he asks one guy himself what are the courses of action and he starts working that as it it's not and in a way you could almost say that the modern staff was built to try to try to simulate what Napoleon did by himself mm -hmm. that, that the Prussians for example we'll talk about this in later lessons, have to come up with a, with a staff of specialized decision makers, people that support decision making, as an answer to this one supreme genius that exists on the other side. Uh, because Napoleon, again, he is a master of time, and he brings he brings enormous energy. Here's a guy in his early days who could spend all day on horseback and then all night dictating orders. Uh, enormous physical vitality was another piece of it. Enormous energy, enormous vision, and I, enormous charisma. Let's face it. Here's a guy who know, knew how to motivate men. That's right. I think that's a good point to talk about how he motivated troops. Uh, they said he had. An amazing charisma, a magnetic personality. You've met him in court, you were dazed by him. Uh, on the field, he could ride up and, and give a marshal's baton to a, a soldier for, for doing heroic things, and all of a sudden the word spreads, look, Napoleon is rewarding someone for great valor on, on the battlefield. He's the one who brings in ribbons. 
uh, to uh, decorate uh, soldiers. He's able to uh, reach out and touch the individual soldier and motivate him because, you know, motivation is difficult and that fervor of the revolution died within a couple years of the revolution. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these veterans at the end at Waterloo are fighting for the emperor. Mm -hmm. There were veterans who go to battle because it's him. And when, the, I think it was Marshal Ney, was, one of them was sent out to stop Napoleon as he was marching Ney. back into yeah. power Ney. to capture him for the king. Mm -hmm. And he reach, meets Napoleon and he just kind of crumbles in front of him and turns over and says, I'm going to be on your side now. Yeah. So his ability to touch out and, and, and motivate the individual soldier was a gift. And it was a highly motivated army when it was at its peak. The other thing I think that was interesting is that he had a, a, almost a photographic memory mm -hmm. and knew the detail. Just like Napoleon, uh, just like I should say, Frederick, went down to the battalions, watched him march, so he understood his entire army. Yeah. Napoleon could remember details and he'd go through logistics records. Names, could walk names. through a regiment and remember the names, names of the old veterans, yeah. And then there's a battle go and take place at some, potentially a battle at some seaport. He'll ask about, are those batteries still on top of that hill? So here's the thing that as you go up higher in rank, don't forget those little details that take you but, down but to the, the other, point of the there's another piece to it too, and, and it's in your instructor notes that, I, that I'd add as kind of a counterpoint to what you say is capacity of detail. This famous quote by him, he says, there are in Europe many good generals, but they see too many things at once. I see only one thing, namely the enemy's main body. I try to crush it, confident that secondary matter matters then settle himself. For all this capacity for detail, here's a guy who could focus in on what's truly important. And he could let all the little worries about this or that go away and, and decide, hey, this is what I need to do and I'm going to take action. Uh, the, the French have a word for it, kudoy, kind of intuition about what reports to discount, what reports to accept, what are, the, what are the key matters of this fight here. There may be some fog and friction out there, but I can focus in on what's really essential. Uh, and, and going after the enemy army was one really change he's made to warfare. Remember in Frederick's time, if you want to avoid battle because an army was a big investment, so you tended to, to fight sieges that ended up deciding the fate of a local county or a fortress or a province. In Napoleon's time, in Napoleon's way of war, there was one object, it's the enemy army. I crush that, then I put my foot on the enemy's neck and I dictate peace. I, I hit him with a decisive battle, crush his army, then I can have my way with him. I have the troops to do it now. The French Revolution has given me this huge army. I can risk battle now. I can go out there and, and go for the decisive action. And I'm going to hit him with this, this thunderous fight, stun him in, into, uh, into, into submission, dictate peace to him. And he'll do that again and again through the, the successful years of his reign. He'll go out there and fight the decisive battle. His yeah, masterpiece is Austerlitz, which is in your in your sure. reading. I think one of the things that to me is is interesting is he's trained a different army. His speed doesn't come like Frederick's speed in marching with a quick pace and a disciplined fire uh, of his infantry. He has brought speed with the ability to bring combined arms and bring corps together onto the battlefield, hitting you from all sides mm -hmm. at the operational level, hitting you with all those combined arms in a, in a integrated fashion on the battlefield. And with artillery being so much more important, you don't have to spend as much time training your infantry mm -hmm. like Frederick did. You make it more of a light infantry, all-purpose infantry, so you don't have to train it as much. It can be replaced much faster than Frederick's. So now if you want to fight against Napoleon, you've got to mobilize your society differently. You've got to be able to sustain losses at a much higher rate, and you've got to be able to replenish and adapt some of the things that mm -hmm. Napoleon does, which means you take a little bit of the core system, you you take his uh, infantry, artillery, and arm uh, cavalry tactics, incorporate them. Da 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 da. -da. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. Uh if you're a European monarch trying to fight, this is a brand new way of war, and it, it, it's, a, it's stunning. It's, 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 it's faster than what you've seen before. Yeah. It's more massive than what you've seen before. At the tempo of warfare is like you've never seen. He's operating, Napoleon's constantly operating inside the decision cycle of his enemies, who are used to moving in that methodical single column from, from siege to siege. Now here's a guy who comes at you in multiple columns and wants to fight the big battle. Well, what are you going to do? The, the case study that you're offered is, is Austerlitz. And again, as I said before, Napoleon Napoleon's masterpiece, and I offered as a kind of a, it's 
amazing example how Napoleon sees a battlefield, has pictures in, its, in his mind, establishes what we'd call in modern parlance information dominance, has an outstanding deception uh, campaign, and then on the tactical battlefield, we've talked about his operational feel for, for a, a fight and when to bring the course together, but the tactical feel, the minute-to-minute -minute awareness of where units are, how, you, how long his units can hold out, when the enemy is going to be in, in a... Uh, uh, a really uh, vulnerable position and then deciding at the exact right moment to commit his reserve into the enemy weak spot uh, to exploit the situation he's already set up days before the battle even goes on. Uh, he also is aware that the enemy's decision site, because it's a coalition, it's Russians and Austrians, it's, it's the old style command and control where the, where the monarchs, the, the Austrian Emperor and the Russian Emperor are, are at least uh, in uh, in name, if not in fact, in charge. There's no coalition doctrine yeah. these guys could work off of. Yeah. No, it fails to help integrate them. Yeah. I think the thing that uh, is, I think is important, when I look at uh, coaching, if you've got a talented team like the Bulls just won, mm -hmm. there's so much more freedom that a coach has in how he plays the yeah. game. He's got the talent, he's got the confidence. I think what you see in um, Austerlitz is a confident Napoleon who can take a risk. It's amazing. We say in warfare you go for the decisive point. Mm -hmm. You take the high ground. Napoleon was sitting on the high ground. He's afraid that the coalition won't attack him. It wa he wants it to attack him. So he comes off the high ground and lets the opponent take it, which already now becomes seductive to the coalition. Napoleon must be weak. He's withdrawing from the high ground. Then he starts digging trenches like he's preparing for an attack on him rather than preparing himself for the attack. Oh, and his right, right flank is weak too. And, he, and that's amazing. And that takes risk. And only a person who has confidence in himself and in his system. Because I think, as we'll see in Waterloo, it's a tired Napoleon, but it's not the same army. He doesn't have the same generals under him, marshals under him. He can't take those kinds of risks. So units that are well trained, well motivated, give a commander so much more opportunity to take risks because he can rely on those people to do their thing. Mm -hmm. And in each of these cases, like in uh, Rossbach, in Leuten, here we'll see in Austerlitz, these subordinate commanders, if you got into the detail of the battle, are helping to bring victory to the supreme commander. Yeah. Yeah. Seidlitz does it at Rossbach. Yeah. You've got a couple of brigade and uh, corps commander that show initiative and heroism to help pull this thing off for Napoleon. But it still reflects greatly on the man himself who crafted this army. This is his Grand Army. He's taken a, quite a bit of time to shape it, train it, mold it to be his fighting machine. Well, if it's so wonderful, how did anybody ever bring the guy down? Yeah, how do you, be, do you have to be as good as the Germans were in 1940 to or beat them? Or as good as the Bulls were this year. Yeah, and to beat them in 45. Do the Allies have to be as good as Napoleon was in 1814 to defeat him in 1815? Or as good as he was in 1807 to beat him in 1815. Right. Or, yeah. And I would say no. What you find is, uh, on the one hand, there's going to be some decline in Napoleon and his system. Mm -hmm. uh, he will never have a, an army as good as the one he took to exactly. to, Why to not? Auschwitz. Why not? Doesn't he have to, isn't he still training them? Not to the level they were in 1805. You know, the, the army that he takes to Auschwitz is an army that has spent a, a period over a year at, at sites along the British British Channel, below, going from brigade to division to core size maneuver. It's an army that's intensively drilled. It's an army that, that is made up of, in large part, of veterans from the previous war wars of the revolution. It's an army that has got officers who have been brought up through through that, that talent search that Napoleon and, and the previous leaders have done. He's got great leaders. He's got well-trained troops. He's got the system in place. He'll never have an army that good again. Uh, you could create it, but there is a problem, I think, in that the revolution created the talent. He did not create a system to keep that good talent point. coming up. So There's no staff college. Th there's no... Uh, exactly. There's no great educational system. Mm -hmm. So what that means, it all depends on Napoleon. And when he's losing, or there's marshals, or they're starting to age and not be as good, he does not have the ability to create a new generation of leaders to replace yeah. them. He is too much dependent on himself. He's probably too vain, yeah. too arrogant to learn from his opponents, to give them credit, yeah. plus to be able to recognize talent yeah. beneath him.
Right. So that's going to be one oh, problem. Oh, You're sorry. not going to have the people underneath you. Frederick the same. He dies basically with a pretty good army, but it's dependent on him. You don't see any great leaders emerging after Frederick. The, the, the guys that are in charge are old guys who just want to imitate Frederick. They yeah. don't want to change the system. Which in large part explains why the Prussian army gets spanked so bad in 1806. Right. Gets, gets a national humiliation at the hands of Napoleon. That's the second of his two classic victories. First Austerlitz in 1805, then there's Jena in 1806. And he's right. taken on the best armies of Europe. It humbled them. And he's the master. You know, where do you go from here? Well, again, just like Frederick had to face an Austria that's constantly getting better, raising the standard, uh, Napoleon's going to have, has to face enemies that, that, are, that are forced, by if they're going to face him, to improve themselves. Austria is one example. Prussia is another. And there's Napoleon himself. His eyes get bigger than what he can digest. He, he looks around. He says, I'm going to make Europe one gigantic embargo against the English, who are the only guys at that point who are holding out to him. By, by 1807, 1808, the only people who are holding out against Napoleon are, are the, the British. British, as yeah. they say. He can't get, get at them because his, uh, he's thwarted by, by Nelson at Trafalgar. Uh, he, d he can't build a French Navy that can face him. So he's going to put, put a blockade on. He figures he will humble this nation of sh uh, shopkeepers with the continental system. Uh, the problem with the continental system, there's some leaks in it. The most prominent at each end of Europe. At one end, there's Spain and Portugal, and at the other end, there's Russia, who don't want to play along. So Napoleon says, well, i got to bring these guys in the system. In 1808, he goes into, into, to go through Spain to get to Portugal, to clamp down on them, ends up in a campaign that turns into a people's war. The Spanish people rise up against him after he deposes their king. He gets into a long, bloody, guerrilla, brutally ferocious, and lots of atrocities on both sides, guerrilla war in, uh, in Spain that eats up, by some estimates, as, as many as half a million French troops over the period from 1808 to 1812. It's what is called the Spanish ulcer that eats away at his mm -hmm. army. And the other end is Russia. Now, that's a whole different thing, isn't it? And that, what's interesting there is, um, with the vastness of space there in Russia, Napoleon just gets dragged deeper and deeper into Russia, not necessarily by design, until he extends his line so far that he can't get back. It, it, it's reminiscent of what yeah. we'll see in, in World War II with the Germans. And he loses, basically, 90% of his army. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he, goes in, he goes into Russia with the same plan he always does on the campaign. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in there with a massive force and force the enemy into a battle. But the Russians say, well, we're gonna fight you, but I think a little further back. And they get ready to fight a battle and they get cold feet and they pull back a little further. They, the Russians don't have this plan from the start of a scorched earth back to Moscow. It works out that way, though. They, they keep, and Napoleon keeps having this idea, I'm gonna bag the Russian army, I'm gonna bag the Russian, like, it keeps sleep, slipping away from him and eventually he's all the way into Moscow. You know, the question is, what now, GI? Well, if I take the enemy capital, he'll be forced to make peace. The Russian Tsar says, not necessarily. And here's this great genius, and he has to scratch his head in Moscow, try to figure out what the heck happened. I won all these battles. I'm sitting in the capital, and he's still out there with his army, and he wants to fight. <laughs> and it's getting cold. I better retreat back. And we'll, here, you have genius yeah. who has created a system, one on the battlefield, forcing opponents to give up, and all of a sudden he finds it's a different ball game. Yeah. And, he, and he's, in a large extent, he's a victim of the kind of forces that helped him along. This nationalism. Nationalism in Spain has given him fits. That's right. Uh, the Spanish people risen again. Good and point. nationalism in Russia has given him fits. Here's a people that refuses to give up even after their armies are beaten in the field and their capital is taken. The Russians refuse to throw in the towel. And then as he falls back with his beaten army out of Russia, the Prussians say, wait a second. We're going to rise up in, 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 a, in a spirit of nationalism and take on Napoleon again. And the Austrians do the same thing. And, and all of a sudden, by 1813, all Europe was ablaze against him, and he's lost the biggest army he's ever put in the field. He's put some estimates between 500, 600,000 men into Russia, lost virtually all of them. He's got to rebuild an army from scratch. Well, he does, he does that. He puts 400,000 men into Germany. He fights a huge campaign in eastern Germany. It, it culminates in 1813, the Battle of Leipzig, which is the biggest battle in, the, in history to that point, with about a quarter million people on each side. He loses. He falls back into France, fights another masterful campaign, but at this point, the French people are running out of gas. The nationalism, uh, the fervor that he'd relied on, the, the desire for glory is just about gone at this point. Well, it'll flicker up one more time. You know, he gets kicked out in 1814, he'll come back in 1815. That sets the stage for the Waterloo campaign. And 
we get to see Napoleon at his best and his worst too, I think. Yeah, I think that's interesting too is that manpower, there's a limit to how much any society can stay fired up with war, reap the benefits of war, and see its people being killed off in war. So you find the character of his army changes. He starts bringing in what you call them mercenaries, forcing Poles and others to fight for him. So it's no longer the national army of the French Revolution in the early period of Napoleon. Then uh, I think if you look at Waterloo, the thing that's also going to be interesting is that because he has been so, so successful, he's basically almost conquered the entire mm -hmm. continent of Europe. The opponents have to get their act together, and they work a little yeah. more on better coalition yeah. warfare. And you're going to yeah. find at Waterloo, when the Prussians get beaten before Waterloo, instead of running away, their king has told them, stick with the British. Yeah. Don't give up, because divided, we're going to fall. United, we're going to stand. So th this defeated Prussian army, or at least part of it, instead of pulling away to its logistic lines, moves toward... Yeah. British yeah. to fight against yeah. uh, a couple Napoleon couple approaches that I'd recommend for for Waterloo, and I think th there's a real accessible article in here, uh, the downfall of Napoleon at Waterloo by by Brit. Uh, a couple ways. One is uh, what I like to do is is have students give briefings, take uh, at the strategic, the operational, tactical level of war. Ask uh, a pair of students, one brief the Allied side, one brief the French side, strategic. Then a pair brief at the operational, and a pair brief at the tactical. That's one way to do it. Another Another one way to, to approach this is is to ask the question, and this is one that's kind of fun: Does Napoleon lose the battle, or do the Allies win it? Kick that one around a little bit. There, yet another way to approach Waterloo is say, what were the key decisions made that determine the uh, the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo? And you could point to several. One is the one you talk about: the Prussian decision to fall back uh, to link up with the British instead of falling back toward Prussia. They move north toward Brussels, and they arrive in the nick of time to, to save the battle at Waterloo. That's one key decision. Another key decision may be Napoleon's uh, decision to send Grouchy after the Prussians. Uh, he picks the wrong man. Grouchy doesn't do a good job of chasing him, and, and as a result, the Prussians get away. Um, what are some other decisions you think are key? Oh, what uh, decision that he doesn't make? Uh, no deception. Uh, just a frontal attack. Or if you look at uh, yeah. Austerlitz, he did some kind of things to force the enemy to come out. Very well, I, I think the enemy's learned that he's not going to come out and play to his strength, but he didn't try anything to deceive him, didn't try a flank attack. It was basically frontal assault, and he left the wrong guy in charge for that. Nay. I, I think that's I think that's a good point there, too. Um, I think his personnel decisions are key in this, too. You look at the core commanders he has at Austerlitz. None of these guys are going to play a key role at Washington. Waterloo. Uh, Sewell, who is one of the corps commanders who led the key attack at Austerlitz, he's a chief of staff now. Okay, he, he has to be, well, Napoleon decides he's going to give him that job because he's lost his old chief of staff. Davu, who held the key, the right flank as, as the key player at, uh, at Austerlitz, is now back in Paris holding down the political situation as a minister of war because Napoleon's worried about his rear area. So all of a sudden you've got a key corps commander now doing political military stuff. Lon, who was his key commander on the left flank, at Austerlitz is dead. He dies in one of these mini campaigns that that, that uh, Napoleon is going to fight against Austria. In this case, in, in 1809. So the old the old cast of characters, the old first string is gone here, and he's playing with second stringers as corps commanders and division commanders. And I think that's going to play a key role. And a too. smart a smart coach in sports will retire after he's won a championship and not drag on. And some people say that, like 1808, 1809, right around that time, already you start seeing Napoleon making mistakes yeah. with increased number because it's only so long that you could be at yeah. the f high level of insight energy health he's a sick man he's a grumpy man uh, he's a tired man he's a defeated man who's trying now to regain he has this urgency yeah. to win so he's pushed to maybe go to battle before he could play to his strengths now he has to play to the opponent's strength by getting a quick victory so he can take back home a victory and say look at I'm winning again because he knows the home front is quick Questionable. That's why he's left a good guy to watch it. But he's also a guy he needed on the battlefield. That is a great point. And this is this is a point brought out uh, in Peter Perret's article that you read early in this lesson, is when Napoleon as emperor is also commander-in-chief, you got some wonderful unity of command. 
it, it allows you at the strategic level to move inside this decision cycle enemy, but there's the downside of it too. According to Pere, and I think he makes a good argument, Napoleon doesn't know any, any way to fight but total war. He doesn't know how to fight a limited war the, the way that you might have in Frederick's time. So he forces his enemy to fight a total war back against him. There can be no negotiation with this guy. You have to crush him because that's the only kind of war he fights. Uh, because he's, he unifies the political commander and, and the military commander together, there's no checks and balances in the system either. It means when Napoleon, the military commander, wants to go out and fight the campaign, there's not a political leader said, no, 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 let's tailor this campaign to the political objectives we have. They're, it's Together they only have, they have one objective, let's go out and crush the enemy. And in the end, that's going to be a downfall. There's no, there's no political restraint to this guy who's, who's out there trying to win the decisive victory all the time. Right, right. Um, one way that I like to look at uh, Waterloo, you might consider it, is that you've got three different armies going to battle. You've got the 18th, army of the 18th century and the British. They're still very much a mercenary, emphasizing marksmanship. They haven't changed that much because their Linear. army just goes ashore, stays close to the Navy, does its fight. If it needs help, it runs back to the, the fleet and, and, and sa sails away. Then you've got the army of the moment, of 1850 in the French army. A sick army, a tired army, a, def uh, a badly bruised army that is not the army of 1804, 5, 6, 7. And then you've got Force 19, you could bring that up appearing with the Prussians and that'll help set the stage for the significant reforms that the Prussians are going to be making that'll set a new standard in warfare replacing that of Napoleon but it'll take until 1870 uh, for everybody to really wake up and say this is now the first class army gone is the French army uh, yeah. it's the Prussian army that's again setting the standard for warfare it's an excellent point I think it's a great drama watching Napoleon rise along with the French Revolution and then his ego uh, start to undermine his genius and finally makes his downfall, which it is it, as a dramatic case study, it's hard to do better than Waterloo. Um, I, I like to, you know, and I'll ask you to, for some closing thoughts. One of the closing things I like to ask students about is, is uh, covered in, in your, your program for joint education objectives on, uh, on the title page of your lesson. It, it, one of the objectives of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is for you to comprehend the relationship between the concepts of revolution and military affairs and the military technological revolution. My question is, what the heck are they talking about? What are a revolution in military affairs? What's a military technical revolution? Well, military technological revolution, in short, by some definition, is when a, when a major technological d developments come along and change the face of warfare. Let's say the appearance of the atomic bomb or the development of the Panzer Division or something like that. A revolution in military affairs, though, is, is something of a greater order of magnitude where the whole nature of war is changed. Now, our modern definitions tend to focus on technology as what drives that change. Um, Again, the atomic bomb, if you want, the appearance of the tank or the, the aircraft on the battlefield, something like that, uh, a major shift in the way war is fought. We say, we argue, and, and the lead article that you have by Parade, Napoleon and the Revolution of War, argues that a revolution occurred and Napoleon was a driver of it, or Napoleon was with its key figure. Okay, well this begs the question, what's the technology that drives that revolution? Uh, the answer is, it's not technology that drives that. At least that's my opinion. And again, this is subject to some con, some considerable debate. I think there's general consensus, though. We could say that. <laughs> <laughs> if you want. Okay. He comes on on the heels of a social and political revolution and uses those, along with his genius, to create a revolution, oh, revolution in military affairs, a whole new way of fighting warfare, a way of war that... that uh, involves the great masses of people, involves decisive bloody battles, uh, involves a level of violence. Again, if you, if you had a scale of violence for warfare where this was thermonuclear exchange and this was perhaps peacekeeping, Frederick fought down here, Napoleon took us up here. Now we're going to keep moving up the, the ladder as we go on and talk about how warfare evolves in the 19th and 20th century. But Napoleon has taken us a quantum leap in level of violence of warfare. He's taken us a lot closer to the kind of total war we'll fight today. It's a revolution in military affairs. Driven by technology? No. Basically he fought essentially the same weapons as his opponents. Absolutely. Good points. Uh, to sum up, one point I think I'd like to make that uh, you suggested ways that you could approach Waterloo and get the students involved with little briefings. It made me think that uh, uh, you could set the stage and get more student involvement by assigning one student and say, okay, what sig most significant change do you see taking place in the French?
French army before Napoleon comes on the scene and argue why. And that takes them into the Napoleon period and how Napoleon uses that innovation or change. Then what is the most important change that comes about of the French Revolution? Have another student do that. Mm -hmm. And then what is the key to Napoleon's greatness mm -hmm. as a person? What's the key to, uh, to a system that he creates? And assign each one, have them do a, mm -hmm. like a three minute summation of their ideas and that could generate some discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, the final thing is to kind of to sum up um, this thing about the revolution military affairs is excellent. If I may mean, then just what are some of the significant changes if you could look at them. One is governments have changed. They're more democratic in spirit and means that they rely more on people power. And you're going to have to make some political reforms to integrate the people in a different kind of way into government. That leads also to changes in the nature and composition of armies. They're going to be more and more national armies with conscription coming from within society and not mercenary armies. And they're going to be large in scope. You're going to have 200,000 man armies appearing on battles instead of the 13, 20,000 that you saw in Frederick time. They're going to be larger armies. And what happens with strategy, rather than sometimes avoiding battles, battle becomes the centerpiece. Because this large army, you can't run away from it. It's not designed to go out there and demonstrate. A lot of money went into getting it into the field to fight. So it's a battle strategy. And the hope would be to get a decisive battle where you obliterate the army and get a political result. If you can't, you do successive battles, keep going after the person until you defeat him. So it has raised the scale of war, change the strategy. It's a battle-oriented strategy with the goal to bring political victory through decisive victory on the battlefield. Annihilating the enemy. Annihilating. And it has brought in a new integration of combined arms onto the battlefield with the main killer now being artillery, mm -hmm. or before it was the rifle, the rifle. You measured combat power by the number of rifles you had. Mm -hmm. Now it's a different kind of technique now, and you're starting to have combined arms coming together. Mm -hmm. So warfare has changed, and Napoleon becomes the model of the great general who can fight in this era of increasingly larger armies.